Hi, I'm Mike Steven and this is Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about disc golf. Disc golf is one of those sports that you can take as seriously as you want or you can t treat it as casually as you want. Personally, I'm a casual person about it. I like to go out there, throw some discs through the woods, get a good walk out of it and have a fun game with my friends. Next up to bat there is the person that takes it very seriously. So that person that takes it very seriously, he can get real specific into his discs, he can take, go to different tournaments, compete all over North America. So we're going to talk first about the discs. So the discs, just like golf, if you compare disc golf to actual golf, a lot of people find that an easy comparison. So just like in golf, you've got your drivers, your, your mid-range, and your putters, same in disc golf. So a driver, we'll start out first with that because that's the first one you usually throw. So drivers are designed to cover the most distance on the course. So this one is called the Enforcer. A lot of them have really cool names uh, and some people choose their disc golf, uh, discs by strictly the name or the color. But there are other attributes that will make the disc either positive or negative for their style of game. We're going to go through a little bit of that as well. So first up, the driver. The driver has a very much so a knife edge on it, so it travels through the air extremely quickly. The negative to that knife edge is that it has the potential to wander. So you don't use your driver unless you need to. Know your distances, know how far you can throw your driver, know how far you can throw your mid-range, and then that will help you decide whether you're going to throw your driver or your mid-range. If you do need your driver, it is the one that goes the furthest distance. One little secret to, uh, that I've definitely learned in disc golf is to throw the disc nice and low. A lot of people think by throwing it angled up, they're going to get a little bit more distance out of the disc. It's actually incorrect. The disc actually comes back and fades back towards you while it's still in the air. If you throw it low and strong, what's going to happen is the disc is going to travel its distance and then it's going to die down onto the ground. And that's what you actually want. So that's the driver. A little bit more twitchy, but you get your best distance out of it. Next up to bat, we got the Culvern. So it's got some cannons on there. This is a mid-range. Um, there's many mid-range to choose from. This is just one of many. So a little bit more blunted on the profile, a little nicer to hold, and a little bit more stable in the throw. Doesn't go quite as far, but it's going to be a little bit more stable for you. Last but not least, when you get within putting range, so when you get to the basket, as opposed to uh, golf, where you have a hole in the ground, these are vertical upright baskets. They have chains hanging down from around the basket. The disc is designed to go, hit the chains, and fall into the basket. There's another type of hole called a tone. A tone is just a pole with a sleeve around it, and when the disc hits the sleeve, it tones or makes a loud metal metallic noise. So, uh, talking about the putter. The putter is very much so rounded and very stable. The putter is designed to have a very stable flight and make it to the basket. So like with most things, probably the putting is the most finessey part of the game. And if you can become a good putter, you can really improve your scores there. So with a putter, some of the attributes that I like in a putter, one thing that I like is I like the disc to be made out of a softer material. Softer materials, when they hit a tree or you miss your target, they tend to die on the ground or just lay flat on the ground instead of rolling away great distances. Because uh, there's nothing worse than going for a shot, you kind of skim off the basket and you end up just as far away from the hole as when you started. Some of the putters are actually made out of rubber. Uh, I don't have one here to show you today, but the rubber ones, those ones are really flexible, so they're not quite as stable in the air, but my goodness, do they ever... When they, when they hit anything, they just die right to the ground or die right to the basket. So makes it a little bit easier to make those putt shots. Next up, we're going to talk about, we talked about the three major different kinds of disc. Within those, there's a few features that'll make you choose discs. First, we're going to talk about stability. So stability is whether the disc flies absolutely straight, whether it hooks or fades. So when a disc flies absolutely straight down a straight fairway uh, and you're aiming at something straight down the fairway, that's fantastic. But there are lots of courses and lots of holes that have fades and hooks. So the difference is the disc, you can throw it straight and an overstable disc will hook off. An understable disc will go the other direction. So in actual fact, once you get into the technical part of disc golf, you're always going to throw the disc somewhat straight. 
but the disc is going to do the work of making the corner on that uh, hole that has either a right bend or a left bend. Next up to bat, we'll talk about the weight of the disc. Weight really has to do with the strength of the thrower for the most part. Um, so you'll have different weights of discs. They're measured in grams and usually on the underside of the disc it'll show you the weight of the disc. So somebody that's stronger and more powerful would probably choose a heavier disc. Somebody that is a little bit more of a finesse player is probably going to choose a little bit lighter disc and they'll actually get better distance out of that. If you don't have the power to throw a heavier disc, don't. So just choose the discs appropriately. So that's a little bit of a shotgun blast of how to choose your discs. There is all sorts of different uh, uh, types of discs. There's all sorts of different stabilities of discs, weights of discs. So there's lots to choose from there. My recommendation is when you first start out, I recommend a mid-range and a putter for around here. The reason why I recommend a mid-range is we don't have any super duper long holes. So most people can get a mid-range within, uh, within putting range. And the benefit of throwing that mid-range, again, is that you're going to be a little bit more stable. You're not going to be off in the trees quite as much. And then obviously, the second disc that I would buy would be your putter. It sure makes putting a lot nicer, and your scores will go up with that. Uh, but you can get as serious as you want. These guys that are very serious about it, they're packing, I don't know, 15, 20 discs on a course, and they've got a disc for every possible shot that they run into. So there's a few accessories in disc golf. One of my favorites is the Biracuda. It happens to sleeve six cans of whatever you're drinking that day and one right at your chest level. So you can stay hydrated out on the course. Another thing that people use is potentially a, disc, uh, a bag for discs. So you throw the bag over your shoulder, you've got your multiple discs in there. You can have some snacks or some hydration in that as well. Next we're going to talk about the courses in the area. One of the things I love about disc golf is it's absolutely free at most places. Uh, around here it's free, uh, it, it all depends when you go out and about in the world. But the Cranbrook course up at the college, absolutely free. It's got concrete tee boxes so you know where you're throwing from. Uh, it's got full baskets, so the pole with the basket uh, so that you know you, you've made your shot if the basket is resting or the disc is resting right in the basket. It's a great course, Has uh, you can play a 9 hole game or an 18 hole game out there. But fantastic course just to take off in an evening, go for a walk, throw some discs through the forest. Next up to bat, uh, over towards Marysville in Kimberley, we have a course over there right by the campground and uh, that's another great course that you can travel, what's that, 20 minutes, 25 minutes down the road from Cranbrook and you can be at that course. Uh, another course that's just going in and that we're really excited about is out at Wycliffe. So Wycliffe Provincial Camp area there, uh, or rest area I believe it is, um, they actually have a course out there. Right now it just has tones, so the poles with the sleeves over top of them, but they are going to be putting in concrete boxes and actual baskets once they get the course dialed in exactly how they want it. But that's a brand new course going in, in the area, so we're super excited about that. Thanks for watching Gear Up, this has been Mike Steven. Hi, I'm Mike Steven and this is Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about hiking boots and all the little odds and ends that maybe go with your hiking boot purchase. We're going to do things a little bit backwards here and we're going to start at the top of the mountain. So if you're up in the high alpine, you're probably going to want a boot that's fairly stiff. You're probably going to want a boot that has protection. This is called a toe rand. So the toe rand comes up, protects the boot against shale and rock, gouging up the boot, gives the boot a longer life. The other thing that this boot's going to have is going to have a fairly stiff shank in it. The shank in the boot is the piece that gives the sole its stiffness. The reason why it's going to be a stiff shank boot is again when you're up in the high alpine, sometimes you can only purchase your foot off of a small piece of rock as you're hiking up. This boot, even with a heavy pack on plus your body weight, you could purchase your foot off just the toe of the boot and you'd be able to support the weight of you and uh, your backpack. So some other things that make this a, uh, uh, an alpine boot or a high level boot is a really tall ankle on it. That way if you're carrying a heavy pack, you step on uneven ground, it supports your ankle a little bit better. Because the heavier your pack is, the more damage you're going to do to your ankle if you do roll over. So again, the heavier your pack, that's going to probably come into your decision making of how stiff of a boot you want. Some of the other things that uh, hikers will do with these kind of boots is 
on the way hiking up, they'll lace their boot differently than the way hiking down. I know that sounds a little bit odd, but it stops uh, an aggressive boot like this from biting in. So a lot of times when you're hiking up, you're flexing forward into the tongue of the boot. So a lot of people lace the top eyelet first and then come back down to the second for going up and then do vice versa for going down because again, you're pushing into the back of the boot. You'll also notice this notch in the back of the boot. That is designed to make it a little bit more comfortable when you're hiking down so your Achilles tendon isn't digging into the back of the boot. So those are some of the features that make an Alpine boot an Alpine boot. A lot of people figure that, hey, buy the stiffest boot possible and then you're covered for everything. That's actually very inaccurate. Stiffer boot is not going to hike nice on level terrain or slightly inclined terrain. You're going to burn your calf out because the boot is so stiff. We talked about that shank being in the boot, allowing the boot to be stiff and support your weight. Also, when you're hiking on that, that moderate terrain, you're hiking off the tip of your toe the entire time. So you actually end up burning out your calves on those long approach hikes. A lot of people that uh, own a pair of these boots to get into the Alpine if they're starting right in the tree level will actually use a second pair of boots or a pair of shoes to get into the Alpine then they'll put these on when they're up in the rocks so that's kind of like your high-end Alpine boot they're also the most expensive there's a lot going on on them and they're also a boot that you probably won't have to replace for a long time just due to the durability of a boot like this they're very very solid next up to that you've got light hikers Light hikers are ideal for those around the lake hikes, those slight incline hikes. Uh, you need a little bit of ankle support because you've got a day pack on, maybe 30 pounds, maybe 40 pounds, who knows. But uh, you want a little bit of ankle support, but you'll feel the weight difference. Weight is actually quite important in hiking boots. A lot of people figure uh, weight on a boot, it can't make that much of a difference. It's actually not true. Weight on your boot is what's called dynamic weight. It's actually moving. So when you lift your foot up, you're lifting that heavy boot. It's actually, if you were to take five pounds and strap it on both of your feet and go for a hike up a mountain, you'd be much more exhausted than taking 10 pounds, those two five pounds added up, throwing it in your pack. So again, having a lightweight boot will allow you to hike faster and more efficiently in the backcountry. Uh, another thing I'll point out on this boot, this boot has what's called a lace lock. If your boot doesn't have a lace lock, there's actually ways to tie a lace lock into the boot. But what this is designed to do is that as it comes into this lock, you pull it tight, that lace is not going to move now down in here. So it's, you can actually loosen this top uh, grommet or tighten it depending on what you want. So having a lace lock in the boot is quite nice. I told you there's a way without it. And all that is is you take the lace and you loop it back on itself. So you basically take your shoe, you loop it two to three times around like this, and that also creates a lace lock. It just stops the lace from sliding back on itself. Then you can have two different zones, the lower foot zone and the upper zone, and you can choose how tight each zone is. This one is often overlooked for hikes. This is actually a trail runner. It's extremely lightweight, it's extremely breathable, it's got amazing traction. This shoe has all you need to do most of our hikes, as long as you've got fairly stable ankles and aren't carrying too heavy of a pack. This is my favorite type of shoe actually to hike Fisher, our biggest mountain in this area. The reason why is because I've got pretty good ankles, I'm watching where I'm placing my feet, I carry a light pack, and I just want the lightest footwear that doesn't make my feet sweat or make my feet uncomfortable. Because again, there's always that sacrifice. When you go to that beefier boot, it is going to be more protection, it is going to be beefier, but it's also going to be heavier and not as nimble as a boot like this when you're scrambling around. The, probably the next thing that you're probably going to do is you're probably going to, when you, when you look at a pair of footwear, is you're probably going to think about the footbed. The footbeds that come in shoes and boots a lot of times are not the greatest quality. It's a hidden item that you don't think about until after the boot purchase. So a lot of times you can think about that in advance and save yourself some foot comfort. So we're going to show you a system here that works quite well. We're going to bring Matt on. The first thing I'll show you is this, this tool. This tool is going to map the bottom of Matt's foot to let us know what type of arch he has. So go ahead and stand on that mat. And what it's doing is it's just taking the heat from his foot, it's transferring it onto this, and we're going to see how high or how low Matt's arches are. Go ahead and jump off, Matt. So if you look at this, you can now see the arch 
right there. There's the forefoot, the heel. Uh, so he's got a fairly high arch. So we know that about Matt now for sure. So the next thing that we need to do is find out Matt's leg alignment. Because you'll see that you've got arches here, you've got leg alignment here. So I would put Matt at a B arch. He's got a fairly high arch. The next thing that we figure out is his leg alignment. Matt, I'll just get you to stand right in front of me here and face me. Put your feet right together, Matt. And what we're doing is we're testing two things. If I can fit two fingers between his knees, that means he's slightly bow-legged. If I can fit two fingers uh, down at his ankles, it means that he's slightly knock-kneed. Matt happens to have a very straight leg alignment. So Matt would be the number two. So you look at Matt, he would be B2. You look into these profiles and find B2. It is, in fact, a high arch profile. So you can see the way that arches, along with leg alignment, actually make a pretty big difference in the fit of uh, the insole. Thanks a lot for that, Matt. <laughs> While we're talking about the inside of the boot, so we figured out a good footbed to keep your foot comfortable on those long heights. Your arch is now supported. The other thing that a footbed does is it keeps your heel centered in the back of the boot. The arch also keeps your foot from rocking forward in the boot. So it's actually doing a lot of things, not just supporting your foot. While we're on the inside of the boot, we're going to talk about heel cups. Sometimes a boot may fit you perfectly, but your heel is just too low in the boot. Heel cups is a way to raise your heel up, get your ankle into the pocket of the boot, because there is actually a cord out pocket in most high-end boots that your ankle bones should sit nicely in. If they're slightly below, this product would allow you to raise up and go into that ankle pocket, making the boot much more comfortable. We'll talk about socks now, socks. There's all sorts of different socks to choose from. Anywhere from like a nice thick merino wool sock. It's going to have some spandex or some elastane of some sort in it. And then a blend of wools or polypropylenes to keep, you, uh, to keep you dry and also to keep you warm. So this is a thicker sock, maybe for winter, fall, spring, that kind of hiking. You've also got socks like this that are woven and spun out of bamboo. Bamboo is a really cool material that actually pulls uh, sweat off your feet and allows your feet to stay much more uh, cool inside of the boot, making you more comfortable. There's also another sock that I'd like to bring up called a liner sock. Let's pretend that you bought a pair of boots and they're just too small. They're only like a quarter size too small and you're having a real tough time. Sometimes just using a liner sock inside the boot, which is a very, very thin sock, will allow you to have the foot room you need. So don't forget that the thickness of your sock does affect the fit of your shoe or your boot. The other thing that people will use liner socks for is they'll double socks up. So they'll wear potentially a sock like this and then they'll wear a bamboo sock over top. It creates a shearing layer. The shearing layer allows you not to get blisters and the fabric takes the rub versus your skin having to take the rub. While we're talking about that, we'll go into everybody's favorite when you have to pull out a second skin. Second skin is an awesome material that every backpacker should throw in their backpack. What it is, is it's a material that can go over top of your skin. If you do have a hot spot or a rub point, it takes the friction versus your foot taking the friction. This can save a long trip, big time. <laughs> Last but not least, we're gonna talk about this stuff. This stuff's called free sole. It's very, very common for a boot ran to start to peel down or even to tear a complete lug off a boot if you're really hard on your stuff. This stuff is really neat. It's very similar to a shoe goo. It's a material that, a polymer, that actually binds incredibly well to rubber. It would glue your rand back down. You can actually replace lugs with it. It's that durable. If you tear your sole free, you can actually pop it under and do a lot of simple boot repairs all by yourself with a simple product called free sole. So again, that's another thing that if you're on a multi, multi-day trip, you might throw that in your backpack. It could save your skin. Thanks for watching. This has been Gear Up with Mike Steven. Hi, I'm Mike Steven, and this is Gear Up. Today we're gonna to talk about cruiser bikes. Cruiser bikes are one of those things that you may not absolutely need, but they sure are high on the list of wants. It's a really fun bike to ride around town, ride on some light duty gravel roads, 
Some people keep them out of their cottage, something like that, because they're a very simple bike. They don't need to be maintained quite as much, and they're always ready to go when you are. Some of the unique things that make a cruiser bike is the body positioning, the accessories that come stock on them, uh, and just the overall feel of the bike. It's not designed for doing aggressive trails or anything like that. It's designed for cruising. Uh, so taking it on city streets, uh, loop around a lake to the mailbox and back, possibly to go grab some groceries. Uh, some of the things that come on a, on a, a cruiser bike, uh, a lot of times fenders will come stock on the bike. So you'll have good full wrap fenders. So whether it be rain or shine, you're not gonna get covered in muck. The whole idea behind a cruiser bike also is that you can just take yourself and put it on the bike. You don't have to uh, get onto the bicycle with riding shorts and all that kind of stuff. If you notice the big saddle here, nice big tractor seat, super comfortable. If you ride it once a year, you're gonna be comfortable. If you ride it 10 times a year, you're still gonna be comfortable. So it's not one of those saddles that's narrow and small and fast that you need to get used to. This guy's kind of comfortable right out of the box. One of the things that I really like about this particular cruiser is if you look at the front wheel here, this is what's called a dynamo front hub. The dynamo front hub has the ability to power the lights on the bike. So you've got a front light and a rear flashing light. The big benefit to that obviously is the day gets away from you, it's darkened. A, automobiles can see you and B, you can see where you're going if you have to duck through a uh, lower light area. Probably one of the biggest defining features of the Townie, which is this model of cruiser, is how long the chain uh, area is or the drivetrain area. If you look at your bike at home, it's probably not gonna be as long as this guy here. So what that, the reason why they've done that is that the bottom bracket, which is this area right here of the bicycle, usually sits right below the seat tube. So what they've done is they've actually moved the crank arm forward on the bike and what that allows for is a lower seat height but still getting full pedal extension. Why that's a huge benefit? You pull up to a stop sign, usually you can't touch the ground at correct seat height. With this style, with the bottom bracket way ahead of the seat tube, you can pull up to that stop sign, stand flat footed at it and then take off as soon as you're ready to go. We're not gonna forget about the wonderful colors that most cruisers come in. A lot of people buy cruisers similar to how they buy their casual clothing. Something they like, the color they like, the style they want. Now moving into style, we're gonna talk about the delivery a little bit. So we're gonna put this guy away. And we'll pull out the delivery. So the delivery name explains a fair bit about this bike. It's able to handle some cargo. So you've got a great pannier on the back that you can throw saddlebags on, baskets. I've got a cool set of wicker baskets on the back of mine. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you've got a huge front basket as well. Pretty much perfect pizza box size. Um, you've got fenders on this bicycle. One of the things that you'll also find fairly common in cruisers is a little bit less gearing. So what that's gonna to mean to you in terms of a negative is maybe you won't be able to climb that super steep hill. What it's gonna be in a positive, a very simple gear mechanism that doesn't fail. It, uh, this runs an internal hub on the back, so it's a three-speed internal hub, meaning you've got three gears and all the gears are inside of the hub. The big benefit to that is that it does not come out of adjustment very often. Once it's set up, and the cable stretch is accounted for, you really don't have to adjust that rear hub much at all. Again, kind of going to the utility side of these things, they're ready when you are. Again, you've got a nice comfortable saddle, you've got matching leather grips into the bike. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we got a unique brake on this bike. So it's actually a drum brake. Drum brakes are kind of gone on bikes, but cruisers like to bring back some of the retro stuff, and this guy uses like a drum brake on it which is kind of interesting. One more thing to point out here is the front tire. The tires on these are called balloon tires. So they're quite wide, but they don't have very much tread on them. The benefit to that design is that it goes down pavement quite smoothly and efficiently, yet when you take it off-road, light duty off-road, 
uh, in gravel or a uh, simple trail around a lake, something like that, it gives you the ability to corner the bike and the bike will handle on that. Also due to the fact that the bike has no suspension on it, meaning suspension forks in the front or suspension in the back, those big tires allow for some cushioning. So you run a little bit lower tire pressure than you would in your average bike, just because this will, the, the tires in essence, become a little bit of your suspension. You know what? That's a little bit of an overview on cruiser bikes. Thanks for watching. This has been Mike Steven.